All right, uh, welcome everybody to uh, Energy 242. I guess it's 291 when you look in uh, Moodle, uh, Solar and Wind. And I'm going to open this up for you for uh, Brad Layton this week. And we will uh, get started on this course. So, first thing I want you to do in your Moodle shell is uh, go on there and take a look in the very beginning at the syllabus. We'll pull that up here. Does not look like it based on course hours. Um, for the most part, this is going to stay pretty much the same. Obviously, the class hours are a little bit off. Um, this is just meeting on Thursdays from 2 to 4. Um, there's course starts out with our uh, we're going to look at a uh, solar thermal and wind energy um, for design of installing systems um, we're going to look at solar constant everybody's pretty familiar with by now thousand watts per square meter laws of thermodynamics we'll take a look at those uh, solar and wind outputs evaluate sites uh, do site surveys for solar and wind thermal load analysis, electrical load analysis, um, estimate energy outputs and costs. So we'll do some pricing on it. Uh, let's see, we're going to take a look, um, find some of the local builders. We're going to design, build, and test a solar thermal system. So we'll play with that a little bit. Um, for everybody who's seen during one of our practicums, we've done solar thermal projects, whether solar hot air, solar hot water. Uh, we have several examples of both systems sitting out in the uh, bullpen that you can take a look at. Uh, we're going to take a look at that. Um, we've also got some, or you can design and build a wind system. Uh, we've got two examples back here at the back of the classroom. We've got the uh, big wind turbine that they built in the 2012 practicum, I believe it was. And then we have the uh, lighter than air project that they used the hydrogen filled balloon um, for a small wind turbine that's suspended up in the air. Um, so we're gonna look at a way um, for you to build a system like that. And you'll present your data from that project. So let's see, our textbook, um, Solar Thermal Systems. And if you ask for the textbook, and I did not verify it, it was over there. Although we call this class 242 for our own clarification to keep track of it, this is actually a 291 course. They may or may not have that book over there. Um, I will check after this class is over and see what we come up with, see if we can't find something. Um, And also check out the library because we may have copies over there as well. I know it's time we had at least one copy, but we may or may not have that anymore. I don't know. Uh, digital multimeter, if you guys don't already have one, you're going to want that for being able to uh, uh, take readings. And if you keep an eye out on Harbor Freight, a lot of times they have a coupon for free multimeter. I've got half a dozen of them at home. They actually work great. They'll, they'll run side by side with the, the big expensive ones. Um, and then a kilowatt meter for measuring power usage. And it's something you guys, if you're looking at the energy field anyhow, it's something you ought to have. Um, they're really handy. You plug it in between the wall outlet and whatever device you're using, and it will measure um, your kilowatt usage for that device. So it's actually pretty uh, enlightening. You know, most things you can look on a label and see how much electricity it supposedly uses, but it's pretty handy to be able to plug that in and see it real world with your own numbers. Um, let's see, so we have the planning and installing solar thermal systems, guide for installers, uh, wind power workshop, uh, the Pigot book is a good book. And then we have the optional, uh, the jaw, and it's uh, also, um, there's some good information in there, um, but that one is optional. Um, the nice part is 
that book by Piggott is pretty slick for uh, building your own because it's common tools, common materials, not necessarily buying, you know, a ready-to-go IKEA wind turbine is something you, you know you're gonna have to assemble yourself. But it's all from stuff that you can buy at Lowe's and Home Depot or or scavenge uh, locally, and it's pretty cool because it teaches that the uh, very elementary level you don't have to be an engineer to understand it uh, but he talks about things as basic as using a gin pole to be able to stand up your your tower for your wind turbine or how to make your own blades um, and how to use some of the alternative things that you want to if you want to use a car alternator instead of you know some pre-made uh, generator there's some pretty good information in there it tells you how to yeah <laughs> Yeah, if you're doing a hydro, don't do it out of a diesel engine with a clutch, centrifugal clutch that kicks in. Unlike our hydrogen or our hydroelectric barge. Um, <clears throat> some other resources. Obviously, um, when you get ready to build something, we have um, our 3D printer available. Um, and there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of do-it-yourself uh, websites. And Home Power Magazine is really good for uh, people that do like to do things themselves. There's the breakdown for the class. Pretty straightforward to everything you've seen before. Our assignments participation is 30%. Exams and quizzes are 40%. And your class projects 30%. So that's a pretty good size chunk of your uh, course grade is that project. So. Uh, you don't want to be last minute um, looking at it. Now is the time to even start thinking about it, whether you want to do solar hot air, solar hot water, or some sort of a wind project. Um, now is the time to start looking at it, start gathering materials, and we'll figure out where to go from there. So there's going to be a, a weekly assignment. Um, there's also a discussion board. You need to uh, participate in the uh, discussions and you'll see those when we go back to the Moodle shell. I'll show you where those are. Um, you need to participate. You need to respond to at least one of your fellow students. Uh, we will get a topic going in there. You'll put your take on that topic. Somebody else is going to put their take on that topic. You need to respond to at least one other student per week saying, you know, hey, did you think about this in that idea? Or, you know, ideally it's not going to be, wow, your idea sucks. Um, you know, constructive feedback. That is constructive feedback. It, it can be. I agree with you. That can be constructive. Sometimes you just need to hear that. But there might be a way to put that other than your project sucks. How about I don't think your project is feasible because of this reason. Um, so you're going to need to get on there weekly and respond, um, participate in the forum. Obviously you can do it as much as you want, but you don't have to do it more than once. Um, online lecture material, quizzes and exams. Um, you're going to need to spend probably three or four hours for lecture material, reading the books. Um, but it's pretty interesting stuff, so it's not too big of a deal. You'll have a quiz or an exam each week. Um, the, I don't think the dates are updated on Moodle yet. That's my project for the next week is getting everything up to speed and ready to go. Um, for your class projects, like I said, you're either um, you're doing a build of some sort, um, designing, building, and testing a system, or designing, building, and testing a wind turbine. Now the other thing is we have coming up right now um, that is an option. We have SpawnCon, Spontaneous Construction over at Home Resources. <laughs> Good. We did that last year. Um, myself, Shauna Munz, and who was the other? I can't remember who else we had there. We had four people on our team though. We built um, we built a, a solar uh, thermal hot air system and it's now on their greenhouse over there. It heats their greenhouse. Uh, pretty cool. Show up on a Saturday morning. 
use the materials that they have there provided. Uh, we actually built a really awesome uh, solar thermal panel. Look nice, uh, very nice setup. They donate all the materials, so you're using their materials for free. And at the end of the day, they judge them. They uh, then they send them off to auction. They decide not to auction ours. They decide they want it on their greenhouse instead. So that's where it sits. Yeah, fun project. I did all the welding for them last year. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's kind of so it's an option, um, and that's coming up at the. Geez, I think the middle toward towards the end of September and I need to get a team together so let me know if anybody's interested in that we'll do that I don't know what project we're going to do yet we could do another solar thermal panel but I'd kind of like to do something different um, just because I've built like 20 of those things now and I'm ready for something new so maybe we do a solar hot water outdoor shower I don't know um, they seem to like the outdoor type stuff so uh, if you have any ideas or if you're interested in participate that get with me in the next uh, couple days probably at the latest shoot me an email and we will uh, we'll get you on the team um, I think we're I think that's what we're limited to is a team of four um, but we can we can uh, work around that if we need to I can just be an advisor and stand aside so you guys can but that would get your uh, your class project knocked out right off the bat um, fairly easily 17th Okay, yeah, the September 17th, so it's coming up very quick, and we have to register for it now. But that's uh, two weeks from this coming Saturday. Let's see. Uh, if you're having any issues at all, whether it be with Moodle, with the tests, with the course material, can't find a book, whatever it is, let us know. Definitely talk to us. We're, we're uh, available anytime. And you guys have had classes with Brad before. You know how accessible he is. So just shoot him an email and shoot me an email. We'll we'll get you taken care of. Um, we're going to talk about solar resources and wind source. Um, our project selection. Uh, we'll talk some theory about wind. Um, do some design review. Um, start sourcing our materials. Um, whatever project you do it has to be in line with what NABCEP says are applicable standards, has to be in line with uh, National Electric Code and uh, all applicable codes. We'll look at um, storage options for our projects and this is not just for wind um, electricity. We're not necessarily just looking at storing electricity because uh, Brad has been working for a long time on ideas for storing heat. And if we can if we can design some sort of a thermal capacity where we can store that heat coming off that um, solar air heater or solar hot water, um, that would be great. Uh, we'll start preliminary building theory on wind. Continue building more theory, more theory. We got a lot of that. Um, review of the local economy. Uh, economics of your project. By now you're getting pretty close to done, right? Towards the end of the semester. Um, what's your return on investment? That's always the number one question. How much did you spend? How much energy did you produce? Uh, what's the payoff? When does this thing pay for itself? Uh, when we look at... What's that? Oh. Yeah, so projects will be done right around Thanksgiving. Um, and then week 14, obviously, because we have our projects done, we have some data from them. We're going to talk about the theory of what did you think you were going to get out of your project, or mathematically, what does it say that your solar panel should be producing or your wind turbine should be producing, and then what kind of data did you collect? What is the efficiency of your project? Um, and does that efficiency make it economically feasible? Would I want to do that to my own house? Um, and then week 15, um, you report on your project and a final exam. So pretty straightforward. We'll go, we'll go through this week by week so you know uh, where you're at or where, what milestone you're supposed to be at this week. 
Um, let's see. This might even be that whole book. Close this thing. Yep. There is the book. I don't know if this is the whole book. There's the Pigot book. That definitely looks like a fairly homemade system. Out of plywood. Um, apparently OSHA is not... <laughs> The OSHA truck is not parked right below him there. Well, it does have more than 10 full time employees, so you don't have to worry about it. That's true. So, the Pigot book basically talks about building your own, your own wind turbine. Um, let's see, I don't know how far this. What's that? I appreciate the whole book. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think it is. And I think we ran into that because the book I had from the bookstore was a different version than what Brad was using for the test. So <laughs> he's like, look at table 4-1, and what does this say? Yeah. It says there is no table 4-1, <laughs> or it's about a totally different topic. So, yeah, uh, any of the quiz questions refer to this. This will be your, uh, your correct answers. Um, but that book is there available, and that's why we put it on there. Some people prefer the hard copy, but um, not necessarily. Not necessary if you can use the use that one. Um, all right, good. We got some people doing introductions. That's good. Please let us know who you are and why you're here. Um, we're gonna have a forum and uh, for your project of what are you thinking about what what is your idea what would you you know what would be the end all be all what you want to accomplish this semester what do you want to build um, just so you know there are we can fund projects and if somebody's looking for a bigger system project we have our new trailer parked out here at the back of the parking lot here our new wind trailer there's two trailers back there, they're both ours, um, and we need to put a new wind turbine system on it. So if somebody really wants to get ambitious on their project, if we can, um, if you want to design a mobile wind turbine system, and that one I would accept if you're building the rest of the system from scratch, you know, the mast and tower and everything, we will buy the wind turbine head for it to, for a one to two kilowatt wind turbine. Um, so if, if somebody's interested in that, let me know. That's going to involve like a lot of welding and a lot of engineering design of the actual structure to hold the, the wind turbine up. Um, but get on there on the forum and talk about your projects and what you want to do. So since this is about wind and solar, of course we love starting off with uh, projects, right? Or uh, word problems because everybody loves word problems so we're gonna we're gonna start with one right here and I'm not quite as slick with the bamboo here as Brad is so so bear with me but we're gonna we're gonna come up with a problem here and let you guys crunch some numbers so So in Missoula, we have an oh. I'm supposed to say average. There we go. Of uh, eight hundred and seventy three kilowatt hours per month usage for the average average house in Missoula all right 
Um, and we're going to look at solar. And we're going to look at uh, solar PV for today, just for the purposes of, of doing our math here. Um, we get 4.2 hours of max solar. per day. What I want to know, what my question is, how big of a solar array would I need to put on my house to provide this and basically give me a net zero power output? What would, how big of a system do I need to provide myself 873 kilowatt hours per month, 12 months out of the year? So in basically let me know how big of a kilowatt solar array do I need to do that. So where would we start? How much power do you put to put out on your solar array? So let's see. Well, based on the numbers we have, a good starting point is how many kilowatt hours a year is that, right? So, 873 kilowatt hours per month times 12 months per year. 10,000, 476 kilowatt hours per year yep so we got 10, 4, 7, 6 kilowatt hours per year divided by 365 days per year. So my years are going to cancel out. 28.7. So equals 28.7 kilowatt hours per day. Okay. Oops, not quite that far. Oh, maybe I did. All right. So I know I need um, twenty eight point seven kilowatt hours per day. Yeah, I need to do that in 4.2 hours, so how can I figure out what that needs to be? Well, ultimately it doesn't matter. I mean, it, when we go to plan the exact array, yes, if it's 300 watt solar panels, it take different amounts. But we'll, all we want to find out right here is how, 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 how many watts do I need? How many, how many watt solar panels do you need? Right. In order to get how what you need how many yeah, how many See, watts? I was, going, I was going totally backwards with that because I was lost. Okay. You, the question you asked was, how big of a solar panel do we need for this? Oh, how big of an array? Up an array. Which an array would be... How, how, how big in terms of kilowatt, not in terms of dimensions? Yes, yeah, yeah, by, by kilowatts, not by dimensions, I'm sorry. Array load. Well, and we can figure that out, too. Um, 
we're not looking for that yet. So how can I figure out if I've got 4.2 hours? How can I figure out? Well, you divide that, that 28.7 by 4.2. Okay, divide it by 4.2. Six point eight three um, kilowatts hours per hour. So that's yeah. Six point eight three. Okay. So Let's figure that out. We'll round that up and we'll call that um, 7 kilowatt Oops. Seven kilowatt um, okay now let's let's throw in our little equation and, and figure out a size wise we're going to figure our average 1,000 watts per meter squared right so So if I need seven kilowatts, I need seven square meters. Equals seven That's assuming we're we're getting that. Um, so we know we need um, seven thousand watts. Anybody know what the going rate for solar installed is right now? Yeah, you could Google and get your, your day today. Um, somewhere between, um, it's crazy because our, our labor costs have gone up, but our solar, I've seen solar for less than a, th a dollar a watt now for panels. The problem is that's about a third, so the bare minimum you're gonna see is probably $3 per watt. So if I need 7,000 watts, you're looking at $21,000, probably as a minimum if you get a good deal on it. And that's probably, that sounds about right, about $21,000 just for the average house. This is 15,000 to 29,000 for 4K, 4K to 8K. Yeah, so we're pretty much middle of the road, so that's, that's probably about right. Um, and let's throw a little more math in there. So if I have what's that? Okay. Yeah, so it's a it's a good chunk on your roof. Good chunk on your roof. But I mean, if you think about it, I mean, it's really not that much. If that's producing all you need for the day. Oh yeah. It's not bad at all. Especially out of four hours a day. So that back to our 843 kilowatt hours per month. And that is at 10.4 cents per kilowatt hour. So how much, what's what's our electric bill going to be? $4. Roughly, yeah. Somebody have a calculator, give us a little better. Oops. Let's do. $90.79 per month. And we figured our cost on this thing was uh, 843. 
Yep. So I can take my. Um, oops. So we figure roughly twenty-one thousand dollars for that solar array divided by ninety point. <coughs> Bless you. Ninety point seven nine. Two hundred and thirty-two months. So nineteen years. Nineteen years. Which is not all bad because you're looking at twenty-five years. Most panels now are guaranteed at least twenty-five years. Twenty-five, thirty. Um, I think there's there are there are some that are over thirty now. So basically, when you replace your panels, you replace your panels. Yeah, anytime you replace your roof, you ideally you do both at the same time. That'll be a ding on the budget. But um, you know, so you're looking at at eleven years. You're looking at almost half the lifespan of the panels is going to be profit. Um, what this does not take into account is um, equipment. Typically, the Inverters, from what we're seeing, grid tie inverters are probably about every 10 years. You're going to have to replace those. That's a thousand dollars. You know that kind of stuff adds up. There is some wear and tear. Um, right. Yeah, this would be assuming a grid tie system. So this is actually very feasible. Um, how about wind around here? Wind is a much cheaper install, right? I can put up, I can put up a, a thousand watt wind turbine for thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, I think ultimately because the solar we can pretty much count on. You know, not every day. You're not going to get forty. 4.2 every day, um, but you're probably it's not going to vary. It's, it's not going to vary as much, right? Um, and depending on where you put it up at, Missoula is not a good place for wind. That's why you don't see anything. Um, I live out by the Y. I get some pretty serious wind out there at times, but it is so unpredictable. There's just as many afternoons that you're sitting out there and the air is just dead still. Um, Whereas you go to Judith Gap, obviously they have a wind farm there for a reason. That wind is pretty constant, and you can you can kind of set your your watch by it. And for some of these guys who are up in higher elevations, up and with the and stuff. Right, where you don't have any uh, obstructions to the wind. Um, is it where you want to put your cabin in? No. Right. You don't want it on the ridge. Yeah. Like that, where you're going to get all the. You're going to need all that electricity just to keep it heated or, and ideally not blow away. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to uh, figure into this. I did a project for a, what was it? It was politics in the environment class um, over at the mountain campus. And one of the, they, they threw me in, you had to do a debate um, with other students at the, this is towards the end of the semester, and it was um, pro wind power, anti wind power, and um, they put me on the anti wind power, which was fine, um, because as you guys know, I can you you can get numbers to say whatever you want them to say, <laughs> um, and you know we started out with the usual that kills birds and you know unicorns That's and. Fun. And it is, it is. It, it said uh, it was like 250,000 birds a year, 2 billion are killed by domestic cats. Every yeah, day. it was point, <laughs> point zero three percent of all the birds killed were killed by wind turbines. <laughs> point zero three of 1%. Um, so yeah, we, we had a lot of fun with the numbers and uh, 
and I just tore them up. And, and one of the things that we came up with that I did for them was, for my team, was we came up with a, a map of if we want to power just the residential section of Missoula with wind turbines, pretend like we're in an optimal wind location, pretend like we're at Judith Gap, but we're powering Missoula with wind turbines. Each five megawatt wind turbine has about a five hour or a five acre footprint. We figured out the land mass of how much area we, we would need just to power the, the homes in Missoula, assuming perfect wind. And I think we figured, um, they usually figure out wind turbines like that is about a 25% efficiency based on downtime for maintenance, um, uh, fluctuations in the wind and everything. So assuming perfect world and we were always getting enough power to power Missoula, uh, we figured out that it would take an area from Reserve Street to uh, Houston and all the way from the Clark Fork River over against you know Blue Mountain all the way to I-90. We saw nothing but wind turbines you know the airport assuming you know the airport and everything wasn't there that's how much area you need to power just the houses with five megawatt wind turbines for Missoula um, and that's kind of cool when you can throw that up as a graphic and show them here's a map here's our shaded area this is can't do anything else. This is nothing but wind turbines. Um, Did we figure out we need nine Mont Montana full wind turbines for the power of the U.S. or something? Yeah, and it's those are a lot. I mean, those are great references to show. I love doing that um, to show people. They're like, well, why don't we use this? Why don't we use that? Solve all the problems. Don't, you know, I've got a problem for doing. Um, you know, for biofuels. We want to get rid of coal tomorrow. How much, basically, two thirds of the United States has to be covered in sawgrass. Every single acre of two thirds of the United States has to be covered in sawgrass to produce the same amount of energy in them as of the coal that we burn every year. Um, so when you start looking at these, um, Right, right. Now, on the other hand, um, looking at the return on investment of our solar thermal panels, if we make one of those and we figure out the, the wattage on that, it's a little bit different because you're only using it six months out of the year, seven months out of the year for heating. What's the difference between a solar thermal panel as opposed to just a PV panel? Are we talking about the same thing? Thermals no. for hot air. Yes. All I'm doing is heating hot air or hot water with the thermal panel. PV panels just producing electricity. Um, those things, because you can build them cheap and you can install them yourself, the return on investment is usually like less than a year. It's a very fast, very fast return on investment. Um, so a question for you, why don't we see solar hot water in the U.S.? Where is where's all the solar hot water in the U.S.? I mean, we've got good areas to do solar hot water, right? If you can do solar PV, you can do solar hot water, right? right. Why don't we see solar hot water in the U.S.? What's that? Wouldn't it be hard to transport it? Well, no, I'm talking about for residential, for your house. If I just want it on the roof of my house to supplement my domestic hot water. You know, that I normally heat with electricity or, or gas or something. Um, so it would just be a, it'd be a closed loop system right on my residence. Any ideas why we don't see it here? It's a combination of coding and it actually has more to do with a bunch of shysters that came through in like the early 70s. Um, as you guys have seen, it, you know, at the practicums we built solar hot water systems and you can really heat some water. Uh, but they are kind of temperamental, and, and you've got to you got to play with them a lot to get them to get them just right. Now, if I have a if I have those sitting you know on a couple saw horses out in the parking lot, kind of no big deal, right? When you start mounting them on the roof of a house and you're drilling you holes, holes your house. yeah, you start putting holes in the roof and you're running pipes down through the house and stuff. There are a lot of uh, unethical folks that that did. Uh, 
solar hot water in the early 70s and they did a lot of damage and destroyed a lot of houses and a lot of roofs and um, you know you have to have a pretty rock solid system now we have um, if you go over to uh, Europe there's a lot of solar hot water and um, they're kind of the same latitude as us as like maybe the middle and southern United States and when you start getting back down around the Mediterranean talking like 60 70 percent of the houses have solar hot water on their roof uh, but we don't see that here and a lot of that has to do with those building codes and, and <coughs> just people got scared away from it at one time and they don't want anything to do with it anymore we run into the same problem up in Browning somebody came through and put up wind turbines in Browning and I don't know how much time you guys have ever spent in Browning they get some insane insane winds up there you know, we're talking 130, 140 miles an hour, you know, getting into tornado, hurricane, well, well above hurricane speeds. They came in, they put up wind turbines and left. They didn't do any maintenance. They didn't tell anybody that they needed to do maintenance. Um, and these things did not have a good fail-safe system on there for overspeed. And so literally it's breaking all the blades off the wind turbines. They, they have a mess up there. Um, now, if we wanted to go put in a five megawatt wind turbine, those things are pretty well proven. You know, I mean, that's kind of a standard across the United States. Um, and Browning would absolutely be a, a good place to do it. But, well, 30 miles away in Cutbank, there's a huge wind farm over there. There's hundreds of those five megawatt wind turbines. But to actually get them on the reservation, not going to happen. They made the mistake, actually, a couple of those they put up um, because everybody thought it would be a great idea. Uh, and it was for the first year without maintenance. Um, a lot of the elders had them put up like in their backyard. So as these things are slinging blades and and uh, uh, over speeding, going out of control from too much wind, um, scared the elders. And what I'm starting to learn of interacting up on up in Browning, on the reservation, if you don't have the elders buy in, nothing's going to happen is not going to do it um, but it's any of these systems all these systems have their pitfalls all of them have things that we need to look into to to say um, do the benefits outweigh the negatives for this particular location um, how am I going to offset these negatives and um, is it economical is it economically feasible what we were saying in our Right, what the total interaction is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can't look at it as a standalone system by itself. Um, because on that solar, unless you have batteries and you have storage, how do you account for a day like yesterday where it looked like we had thunderstorms, even though the sun was shining? It, it was as dark as if we had thunderstorms overhead all day because of smoke, right? You're going to have days like that. You have days where your solar panels are covered with snow. And... You know, do they put it on one of our houses? Can we go out there and shovel it off? Yeah, no problem. Or, well, carefully sweep it off, you know, the the solar panels. Yeah. If it's on your 80-year-old grandma's house, is she going to go out there and clean off solar panels? No. So we have to, we have to make uh, exceptions or accommodations for those days where it's going to be, some days it's going to be a little bit more in June, on a great sunny day. You're going to be cranking out some, some PV solar, right? on you know December um, during a snowstorm probably not gonna be putting out a whole lot of electricity so that's the kind of stuff we got a figure on and and we need to look at um, where do you find that kind of information how did I find um, 4.2 hours of solar max solar per day where did that information come from Tell you what, go, uh, if you've got your laptop here, if you don't, write it down. PV Watts is your friend. And they have two different versions of it. They have the old version and the new improved version. 
yeah, go to the old version, not the new improved, because the old version allows you to put in all kinds of variables. And the nice part about it is, what it will tell you is what your solar insulation is, which is the amount of sun you know hitting hitting that surface um, for any month, and it'll tell you at what angle. So as you change the angle on your panels, you can also change the tracking, either non-tracking, you know, fixed, but you can change how many degrees is it facing? You know, do I want to do it directly 180 degrees south? Or do I want to do it maybe a little bit southwest or a little bit southeast? As you change that variable, it will change your output. So they have the ideal angle of throughout like every day of the month? Yeah, every day of the year. Um, it's a math all in itself. Yeah. To know, you know, the, pat the patterns, you got, you know, patterns plus, you know, angles. Yeah, it'll basically simulate your your solar array for the entire year if you want to sit there and spend enough time. But that's where that 4.2 hours came from. Um, the information's out there. We just, you know, have to know where to find it. Yes, like this video will be on the Moodle shell. Um, they go to Brad for right now. I'm going to put him on the hot seat. Um, this will go to Brad, and then he posts it up into the Moodle shell. Because I, I don't know where I found the first lecture thing, but I could find it again. It was just a link in the email, I think. Oh, yeah, the YouTube one is just a link. What will happen is the links will go on here. Um, you know, for week one, this is, you know, lecture number one. It's going to go right down here below the project. Or actually, I guess it'll go right up here. While we're here, I have one more question. Um, <coughs> the quiz dates were not on the syllabus, and the quiz date on the quiz itself says 2012 or something. So, like, dates for the quizzes, this first one coming up, is it going to be, like, Friday? Yes, and the, I just have to update the Moodle shell. It'll have these dates on it. Um, but if you look at the syllabus, it'll tell you when, when it needs to be done. And when I update those, I'll send out an email to everybody saying, okay, the quiz is open. Take it before, you know, take it before Monday, take it before Tuesday, whatever. This class only meets on Thursdays. So I think probably, I guess I'll speak for Brad a little bit. Um, normally, we want to, on the class day, you're starting the new week. So this week will be up through next Wednesday night at midnight. So the quiz will open up, you know, probably, I mean, there's no reason why I can't open it up uh, today, but you need to go through, you have to have all your uh, posts on the forum done by next Thursday. Um, and you need to have the assignment and the quiz or exam done by next Thursday. So. And like I said, the quiz the exams may not be up to date. I still have to go through every single course and re redo it for the new year. Um, but that's how it will look for, for all those. It will always be um, the weekends on uh, Wednesday night at midnight for class the next day. Class the next day, we're starting into the next you know unit or whatever it is. All right, I'm going to stop this recording. <coughs>